We're here today with Robert Bailey. He's with the University of Ni Illinois in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And, yes. and you gave a presentation this morning on uh, male circumcision and some of the some of the latest information. And, and a lot of this information has been was we knew about five years ago, but now we have the science to back it up. Yeah, well, you know, for many years, um, people noticed that there were tremendous disparities, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in the prevalence of HIV in different countries. And uh, for a while, it was suspected that it had something to do with male circumcision, because in the societies and the regions where circumcision is highly prevalent, HIV rates are very low. But in countries where circumcision <coughs> is, is not traditionally practiced, then HIV prevalence is very and high. Sub-Saharan Sahara, <coughs> Africa, yes, you were mostly, showing that. Mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, exactly. So, um, so actually, just recently, there have been three randomized control trials completed looking at the question of does circumcision reduce the risk of HIV acquisition in heterosexual men? And indeed, what we found is that there's a 60% protective effect of circumcision against HIV uh, infection. So <clears throat> in circumcised men, um, there six out of every 10 infections are prevented by, by circumcision compared to uncircumcised men. So it's a very exciting uh, finding since our tools for preventing heterosexual transmission of HIV are very limited. Mm -hmm. And so now we have this new proven effective weapon against HIV. And to put it in another context, I think you gave some information that said uh, a circumcised man is two and a half times less likely to transmit the virus. Am I remembering that correctly? Not to transmit, but to oh, actually to, acquire to the virus. Acquire, so, okay, to acquire the yeah, virus. So actually okay. uncircumcised men yeah. are two and a half times more likely to become HIV infected than, than circumcised men. So, so yeah, the protective effect of circumcision is, is very significant. In fact, if we had a vaccine that was effective as circumcision is found to be, we would be very excited and <clears throat> international uh, agencies and donors would be falling all over themselves to roll out such a vaccine if we were so lucky to. Or if we had a microbicide right now that had a 60% success rate, right? we would be uh, not as excited, but maybe a little bit no, more No, we'd excited. be ecstatic because yeah. at least there would be something for women, you know, to, to offer them some control uh, in terms of their protection. Uh, right now, women are very vulnerable because they don't have a tool that they can control. They have to rely on a male you know, to use a condom. So microbicide you know, is, <clears throat> it will be a very important development if, if we can ever develop it. I think I remember from Toronto last year, the aspect is, is more of a human rights issue to provide this because women do, do often in these societies do not have the control over, their, over, over you know, how they, when and where and how they have sex. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the concerns about circumcision is that, you know, it's, it's yet another male-controlled uh, prevention strategy. But when you think about it uh, from a public health perspective, if, if uh, circumcision can get rolled out and a significant proportion of the population becomes circumcised, mm -hmm. that's going to reduce HIV infections in women as well. One of the concerns is that, well, you know, women, will, I mean, men will now use circumcision as, a, as an excuse to not use a condom. And that's why it's going to be very important as we provide circumcision services that it's not done just as a standalone surgical procedure, mm -hmm. but it's integrated with all of our other HIV prevention And all strategies. sexual health care so that people are, who get circumcision receive some sort of informational and, and and knowledge base that what it does and what it doesn't do. Right, it's going to be very important to have good strong counseling associated with the procedure so we can actually teach men about the concept of partial protection um, and also we have an opportunity to access a part of the population that seldom you know is not accessed by health workers and at health facilities. So young men often don't come to health facilities, don't get HIV testing and counseling, and so now there's an opportunity to access those young men and provide these other services. Well, you, you gave some, and for people to really understand this, you gave some very uh, statistics of what we could expect within the next 10 years, say, in a Sub-Saharan Africa if there mm -hmm. was circumcision taking place. Could you? Mm -hmm. 
Could you go over the, well, some of those Well, if you numbers? assume just a 50% uptake of circumcision in areas where circumcision now is not traditionally practiced, if 50% of the men become circumcised over the next 10 years, uh, modeling <coughs> can show that actually you'll reduce the prevalence in these areas by about 50%. So in, for example, where, where we've done our randomized control trial in Kisumu, Kenya, currently 18% of men are HIV infected. Well, over, if 50% of those men become circumcised over a 10-year period, there would be a reduction from 18 to about 8% HIV prevalence over that period. And of course, if you're preventing infections in men, then secondarily, you're preventing additional infections in women. So the prevalence in women also declines uh, as prevalence in men declines. Could you go over some of the, you gave a kind of a, we were talking about earlier, cost-benefit analysis where if you're talking about societies where you have a high prevalence of HIV and mm -hmm. a low circumcision rate, it makes economic sense to do circumcision, could you? Yeah, there's, there's been studies and modeling that, that have shown that in high prevalence areas such as in parts of South Africa where there's 25 percent prevalence that um, if you provide circumcision uh, at current cost levels that over a 20 year period um, the cost effectiveness of circumcision is it costs about $181 per HIV infection averted over that 20 year period compared to prevention of maternal child transmission, condom promotion, most of our other HIV prevention modalities, circumcision is highly cost effective. And one of the things you showed in your graph was whether you have a slow startup or a medium startup or a fast startup, some mm -hmm. of the uh, advantages of why wait? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, modeling has shown that if you can actually um, roll out circumcision more speedily, um, then you actually end up saving more lives and saving more money than if you just uh, roll it out gradually. Even if after eight years you end up with the same number of, of men circumcised, still that, that rapid rollout of circumcision uh, ends up saving about 16 to 20 percent more of infections and also uh, saving about 10 percent on the cost per infection averted. So a rapid rollout is going to save us uh, lives and save us money. But another thing you mentioned that is not an immediate effect. It, you know, it's not something we can expect like an uh, antiviral where your T cell counts are going to go down mm -hmm. or go up immediately after taking the, taking the medication. Yeah, yeah, there's no question it's an investment. So it's an investment. It, it, yeah. it occurs over years. It's going to take years for this to take hold. But, uh, but over a 10 to 20 year period, it's going to have a very significant impact on the epidemic in many of the, or virtually all of the highest HIV prevalence countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Another aspect I, I found interesting was that th where circumcision was made available, it was actually desired by many mm -hmm. of the people who went out to s seek it. Yeah, I mean, even in, in non-circumcising communities currently, um, there's really a desire, by, particularly by young men, to get circumcised because circumcision is equated with increased cleanliness and through better hygiene and cleanliness, um, then there's the reduced risk of STIs or sexually transmitted infections. So even in the non-circumcising communities, uh, anywhere from 60 to 85 percent of young men really would prefer to be circumcised, but those services are not available to them. And so if we can provide those services th that are safe, affordable, and provide voluntary circumcision, the evidence is, even in the small programs that have been started up, is that men will come in big numbers. Well, I'm going to let you take off your science hat a minute and, and more of the social hat. And what do you see happening and what do you where do you think we go from now with the information we have and, and what is the prognosis we can hope for? Well, I mean, currently uh, the normative agency, WHO and UNAIDS, have come out with a very strong endorsement of circumcision. And so <clears throat> the next step then is to have policymakers within separate countries come out with, with the statements endorsing circumcision and essentially saying that it needs to be provided to their people 
uh, because it's so advantageous. Um, and so there are now task forces and, and government agencies that are working on such policy statements. Once the governments of these countries endorse circumcision, then um, it's then donors and international agencies are going to be able to come in and assist in um, in providing technical assistance, in providing training, and also improving uh, resource poor settings, some of the health clinics and some of the places where circumcisions are going to be done. They have to be upgraded so that we have proper sterilization and also um, uh, VCT, you know, voluntary counseling and testing, and, the, and our other HIV prevention strategies combined with circumcision. And that's the, a good closing point uh, that March of this year, uh, the World Health Organization and UNAIDS did make that strong statement, and I think that's where we move from here is getting more people involved and getting that message out there. Mm -hmm, exactly, yes. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of a very busy conference and, mm -hmm. and giving a us your information and sharing the message. Sure. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.